I'm going to assume that we're on, and uh, our uh, panel this morning has uh, been deeply involved in providing the support that's needed by faculty to move all aspects of their courses online. I'm Richard Clark. I'm moderating the panel. Uh, my interest has always been in the, uh, the research on the ways to use technology effectively for teaching and learning. Each one of the panelists has been asked to summarize what they feel were the positive changes that occurred uh, during this crisis and those that should be continued into the future um, to describe what kinds of support the centers and faculty need to succeed. Now, I'm sure they've seen all kinds of other sorts of experiences, including some that were very difficult, but we're going to focus this morning on those that were the most positive. And I'm going to ask each participant to introduce themselves, to describe their institution, their, their role at their institution, and also to give us their views on those positive developments and what they feel is needed to support for faculty and for students and for other support staff in universities. So the first panelist that we're going to hear from this morning is Dr. Laura Weiner, McGill University in Canada. Uh, Dr. Weiner. Hi, everyone. Um, some of, we're located in Montreal, uh, which is now one of the uh, hotspots in Canada for COVID. So we are far from being out of the woods in terms of this pandemic. So it's a welcome opportunity to think about what we need to retain going forward. Um, but we, I, we were thinking about this in terms of going forward, even beyond uh, the pandemic route when we get back to whatever the new normal is. So I am the director of teaching and learning services at McGill, and we are in charge of supporting all instructors um, in their teaching. We are also responsible for the online learning environment. So we have always been deeply involved in this area. Uh, as well, we do programming for students, but that's something I, I won't get into at the moment. Prior to the pandemic, we were almost entirely campus-based teaching institution, although our learning management system does have, well, it did have a presence in almost every course. That presence could range from something as minor as that's the place that the course outline lives so that you can always find it to very extensive use by some of our professors for really creative uh, engagement and feedback activities. So there was, there was a big, big variety. Um, what do I hope to, that we will keep uh, post pandemic whenever that turns out to be? Um, one of the things, and I should also mention that McGill is a, is a research intensive university. So that teaching has always been a little bit of the poor cousin, even though uh, senior administration would always go, no, 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 it's equally valued. Uh, the word on the street was always that research came first. Um, but that has just swung around tremendously um, in the last six months. There's a new focus on teaching uh, at both the individual level of what individuals are thinking about offering, uh, thinking about their own careers and thinking about their own activities, but also at the institutional level in terms of the value placed on it, in terms of the priority, in terms of the resources allocated, the level of discourse, what makes up good teaching. We're having those conversations in ways that we never had them before. Another thing is McGill is uh, a very risk averse institution. Um, I've often said, we'll, we'll never be accused of jumping on any bandwagon. We, we don't do that, but we've had to take risks and many of them have resulted in really positive experiences. Some of them, you know, we kind of had to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off a little bit and get back on there. But overall, I think people are starting to recognize that you can take a risk and the world won't end. You know, the end of the world will look somewhat different than taking a risk in terms of certain kinds of teaching. Um, so what I hope we can maintain is that willingness to experiment, the willingness to take risks, recognize the role of blended and uh, technology mediated uh, educational activities even within a campus-based institution. Another big area of, of questioning has been related to assessments. 
we traditionally had a lot of our courses that were the two midterms and a final route. And the final would be very heavily weighted. Because we decided very early on uh, in March, even before we went back uh, in April to the online, to the remote learning environment, that we were not going to have any kind of proctoring. So none of our uh, final assessments, final exams have any kind of proctoring software. This has meant that professors have totally reconsidered how to assess because they can't rely on the invigilation protection route to guard against uh, breaches of academic integrity. And they've been focusing on multi, multi, uh, multiple low stakes assessments. They've also been trying to create um, the kinds of assessments that are much harder to cheat on because they're very, they're customized in certain ways. Um, but it's, it's provoking um, a conversation about assessment, which is really welcome because we're in the process of re revising our assessment policy. Um, so we're trying to shift from a culture of surveillance to a culture of supporting learning. And that's a big shift for a university like ours. Uh, we've had collaborations with colleagues that we never would have had before. And I really hope that those continue. We've been using communications technologies in, in, in really appropriate ways. We've been doing webinars and, and these kinds of activities which didn't happen before and they're very well attended. I hope we can keep that going. Um, and the other thing uh, is a really tighter integration of the student and professor viewpoints of looking at everything through the dual lens. So what does this decision mean for students and what does this decision mean for professors? There's been a lot of talk about student well-being and student wellness and we're trying to make sure that professor well-being and professor wellness is also considered in what are the, um, the consequences and the implications of certain decisions. We were asked to think about also what's required in the future to succeed. And I think it's really about institutional will. Um, if the leadership wants to revert back, take away the financial support, take away the kinds of flexibility that's been introduced, um, not update the reward and recognition process to really value teaching, we're just gonna slide back. If there is an institutional will to maintain it, and we've already heard from a lot of people uh, in, of, from professors saying, you know, this is really cool. And when I go back to campus, I'm going to keep this. So I think that there's a lot of local grassroots um, work that's been done and the change is getting embedded at the grassroots level. And my hope is that it, that helps support uh, an institutional change to keep a lot of the positive things going. Um, you know, if it weren't also awful, this has actually been amazing for considerations of pedagogy and higher education. We're reaching more people, we're having more discussions. Um, so we, we have to try and retain the positive, I think, and I'm, I'm hopeful. I think we're all hopeful. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Weiner. Um, we're, it's interesting the points that you made about uh, uh, assessment, and I'm hoping maybe we could pick it up when we get into the discussion. I think other people might have noticed some similar things. We're going to go next to uh, a very different part of the world. Uh, this is, it's easy to forget that this is an international problem, that all countries are having the same issue. So we move now to Lebanon and Dr. Fauzi Baroud in Lebanon. Uh, Dr. Baroud, would you introduce yourself, please, and give your views about what's going on? Your challenges go yeah. far beyond COVID in Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, greetings from Beirut, Lebanon. Uh, my name is Fauzi. I'm uh, the Assistant Vice President for Information Technology. And also, I'm managing the University E-Learning Center. And uh, recently, I've been appointed uh, the UNESCO OER Chair for Access and Success at the University. Well, actually, uh, Notre Dame University, it's a Lebanese university adopting uh, the American system of study. We have around 5,000 students. Uh, we have three campuses. One, uh, our main campus is uh, 
uh, east of Beirut, and we have one in the north and another campus in the, uh, we call it the uh, Shouf area in Lebanon. So uh, let me start uh, by saying, or by mentioning, that uh, I do believe that there is a paradigm shift that has occurred in the education system during COVID-19. And uh, moving from face-to-face -to, -face to online teaching and learning has become a, a reality. And we all know as educators that, you know, we have witnessed radical changes in educational that occurred several, uh, at several points in history uh, before, like during the Industrial Revolution and after World War II. However, the recent global shift uh, to emergency remote teaching, I call it actually, I don't call it online, I'm still calling it remote teaching, emergency remote teaching, for so many reasons, it occurred for the first time in history as a result of the pandemic. And this was uh, exceptional for us because the pandemic has impacted our mental, our social, and our economic well-being in different ways, and we had to deal with all those impacts. In Lebanon, in Beirut, Lebanon, it's a bit different. We have faced multi-layered, I call it a, a multi-layered challenges, including economic uh, meltdown, political and security instability aggravated by the pandemic. So it's not just the pandemic, we had to deal with so many other uh, challenges. So what I mean, uh, you know, what, what I really mean is that the shift to emergency remote uh, teaching in Lebanon occurred not only because of the pandemic, but also by the country political turmoil that led to closure of schools and universities from October 17, 2019 till January 2020, and this is what was known by the uh, Lebanese Revolution, October 17 uh, uh, Revolution in Beirut. So the, the pre-pandemic, I call it the pre-pandemic actually, or the arrangement that we have done for shifting to remote teaching at my university helped us uh, transition smoothly from later on, yani from face-to-face uh, 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 -face to uh, online teaching in February 2020. Now, if I want to talk about uh, uh, the lessons learned, uh, by the way, you know, I was in charge of, with my small team, I have a very small team, where myself and I have five team members with me. And I was in charge of uh, doing all the training, technical support at all levels technical support for faculty members, training for faculty members, technical support for our student too. And uh, uh, the support we have offered, we were working around 18, 20 hours per day maybe at the beginning. So uh, the lesson learned from uh, our shift to this emergency remote teaching at our university and the U. The first one, uh, and this is the, uh, I've been with, I've been with uh, this university for the past 30 years now. But what I have noticed is that senior faculty members who were thought as uh, resistant uh, to change had been receptive, very receptive to the online training that we have offered and were smoothly inducted into the process of this remote teaching. And this is something really we have to build on it. And it's very important thing that we have noticed. Uh, we also uh, learned that the emergen uh, emergency remote teaching uh, engaged faculty member, our faculty member, in renewed discussion and self-reflection about best pedagogical practices to adopt in content delivery and as especially the assessment. A lot of debate, a lot of discussion between faculty member about the assessment, how we're going to assess, what are you doing with the assessment, so on and so forth. Another thing I would like uh, uh, to talk about is uh, the traditional, you know, I call it the traditional separation between faculty and student that we see in brick and mortar usually. You are the instructor, I am the student. There is this separation usually in, you know, whenever we are uh, at the university face to face. 
but it was minimized in this uh, remote teaching because students had been consulted about uh, uh, the syllabus and the syllabi and ways of the assessment during the pandemic. Yani the important thing here that we discovered that listening to our students' voices and engaging in open, authentic dialogue was very important. Because, you know, we had, the, you know, student uh, uh, representative would come to the university, meet with the president, meet with the deans, meet with the SAO student affairs office to discuss ways about syllabus, how we can minimize it, how about the assessment, what we can do. So their voices were heard. While in normal uh, situation, this is the syllabus, office hours, uh, exam one, two, and exam three, that percentage, seven absences from, uh, from the course, you, will be, you have to drop the course. You know, we have to go by all those policies, which, you know, we have seen it change in, uh, uh, during the remote teaching. And I think, and I believe this is something we need to build on, the student voices. We have to listen to our uh, uh, students. Another uh, important point is leadership, you know, like uh, what the president especially, uh, what he has initiated at our university, uh, a faculty student continuing uh, uh, communication through the pandemic. <clears throat> For example, the student affairs office and a lot of faculty members, uh, they contacted our students to ensure their welfare and if they needed help in any way. And uh, it was very visible. Uh, at the university level, and it was very much appreciated by uh, by our students. And this is, uh, uh, it is based on uh, a survey which was sent to the student, and we have the result, how satisfied you were, uh, all those things. Uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, I want to say here that MDU, in humanizing and democratizing, you know, talking to our students, uh, that's why I say humanizing and democratizing, uh, this teaching and learning process during this pandemic uh, represent, I believe, a, 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 a starting premise uh, for a wider engagement in envisioning plans for leveraging the human aspect of education that has been neglected uh, in higher education in recent years. Finally, if I want to sum up, I would say the experience we gained during the, this crisis offers a good opportunity uh, to better prepare for future crises. So universities in general and our university in particular should move from this crisis management situation to what I call long-term planning, strategic planning uh, 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 for the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Baroud. Um, Interesting point about your sense that this is becoming, as you put it, more humanizing and more democratizing. That's a, that's a very positive development, I'd say. Uh, our next speaker uh, is, we're going to move back around the world again, back to Canada, to David Hornsby, Dr. David Hornsby uh, at uh, Carleton University. Uh, Dr. Hornsby? Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Clark. appreciate the opportunity to be here, and it's really nice to see all of, uh, all of my colleagues on the panel, but greetings to all the participants who are muted and uh, camera not having their cameras on, uh, just sending you a big hello into the virtual space. Um, Carleton University is a uh, comprehensive university in Ottawa, Ontario, our capital, uh, capital uh, of Canada. Um, we have uh, you know, about 30,000 students. Um, when we talk about comprehensive universities, we talk essentially about universities that don't have a medical school. So the difference between Laura and I's university is really ultimately a difference between a medical and non-medical uh, institution. Um, the a wonderful bit here for me is that, you know, I've just started uh, my third year at Carleton after having been abroad uh, for about 15 years. I was based in South Africa at Witts University in Johannesburg uh, for about 10 years and then a total of five years at in the UK at Cambridge and at uh, University College London. So I feel like I've, you know, full, come full circle uh, in, in the sense of uh, teaching and learning in different uh, types of spaces and different types of experiences. Uh, and I have to say these are, you know, incredibly extraordinary times we're living in. And I know that all of us uh, have interesting stories and, and reflections to bear. But I wanted to, to really just offer, I think, three positive changes that I think have occurred. And, and this is to build off of what's already been, already been said by my colleagues. 
Um, Cause I agree. I agree fundamentally with their reflections as well. I think the first positive change that I would note has been the pedagogical renewal that has taken place uh, in a time of pandemic. Um, what we have seen uh, in quick order is a complete rethink or uh, a refocus on pedagogy and the importance of different types of approaches. Um, I would agree with uh, Fawad, um, Dr. Baroud's uh, reflection that this isn't online, it's remote. I think that's an important one to, to distinguish upon. But even in a context of, of it being a, a remote type of it, dynamic, there are different types of pedagogical strategies that are required. And, and what this has done as a positive has got people to start thinking again about their pedagogy, thinking about what's most appropriate and what they need to do in the environment that, they, that they're existing in. And that's great um, because that starts to inculcate a culture of reflection um, that we all aspire our colleagues to maintain in our institutions. And I know uh, we all lament on occasion as well as it's not, uh, not being sufficient. So I think that's uh, positive change number one. Positive change number two is the demystification of online. Um, I think what we've seen here now is uh, a sort of, we've crossed a Rubicon, we've crossed a threshold um, where a lot of the tools that are available uh, in online spaces are now understood better than they ever were before. And this, I think, will have a long lasting impact uh, on you know, on how our, our curriculum is delivered. I'm not saying that all of our institutions are going to go completely online. I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. A lot of us see the value in the face-to-face -face instruction as well as, as the online. But what I think we're going to see is a lot more use of online tools um, in a uh, face-to-face type of environment. And I think that's a, ultimately a positive thing because, you know, that can bring efficiencies, that can bring new ways of engagement, that can meet our students where they are at, because we all know our students are, have competing priorities, particularly around uh, work and, uh, and study. And I think that's, that's ultimately a, a positive thing to reflect upon. I think the third uh, piece here that I would like to say is a positive change is the notion of partnership. Uh, I think we can talk about partnership internally, being uh, teaching and learning centers now being seen as legitimate and effective partners to our instructors to affect uh, pedagogical design, but also between our students and our faculty as well. Um, you know, particularly at Carleton, we've adopted a students as partners model, particularly in the pandemic, to try and get our instructors, to assist our instructors in, in moving to a space where they're adopting better pedagogical practices. And that's something that has been really quite powerful. Um, we didn't anticipate it to be as powerful as it was, um, but it, it has, it, I think, has fundamentally shifted the culture in, at Carleton University in particular. And this will be something that we'll try to keep going uh, moving forward because of, of the benefits. And, and for many of you who have engaged in the Students as Partners literature, uh, you understand uh, pr primarily how, how beneficial these types of relationships can be. So how do we keep these sort of positive changes? Two reflections. I think one is absolutely along the lines of what Dr. Weiner was saying with respect to the need to institutionalize a lot of these initiatives that we're doing. We have to find ways to um, regularize uh, from a budgetary perspective, but also within our collective agreements, our work arrangements, uh, the, the initiatives that we've, we've been able to kick off to help with the pivot to the remote learning environment. And that's gonna take a degree of convincing, that's gonna take a degree of advocacy, and that's gonna take a degree of what I would say is a second, um, second sort of way to keep the positive uh, changes, activism. And I think this is something that isn't necessarily uh, comfortable for teaching and learning centers uh, in, in sort of in, in tradition. Um, you know, my experience certainly from the, the various spaces I've been as teaching learning centers I always seek to be helpful, uh, to be positive and constructive and to, to assist in affecting good pedagogical practice, but they've never really been proactive about it. They've never been, act, they've never been activist about it, going out and talking about uh, good pedagogical practice from, from a space of knowledge and experience. And I think that's going to be something that we're going to have to do uh, post pandemic in order to really solidify and keep these positive changes. We're going to have to, to some level, uh, become activists ourselves. So Richard, that's where I'll leave it for now.
Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Hornsby. A, a number of interesting points that I hope we can pick up on later. Um, uh, our next speaker was to be Richard Pinay, Dr. Pinay from uh, the uh, University of Laval, uh, Ottawa, sorry, in Canada. Uh, he's uh, uh, got an emergency this morning, so he apologizes he won't be here. Uh, so we're going to go next. We're going to switch again to a different part of the world. Uh, Dr. Bart Rientis from the UK um, at the uh, Open University. Uh, uh, Dr. Rientis, you're next. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Clark, for giving me the floor. And I really enjoyed the conversations um, because it's really fascinating to see how we all as educators tr are trying to make sense of the world in this very difficult and unprecedented times. And I work um, as the head of academic professional development at the OP University UK. And we basically you would probably expect would be able to cope with this without any problems because we are a distance learning university. And let me tell you, it has not been as straightforward as you might expect. One of the things which I think slightly distinguishes us from other universities is that we um, teach in four different nations, namely England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And all these countries have different governments and different regulations. So in a way, we are a kind of transnational university trying to make sense of how we can support our 170,000 amazing students while at the same time supporting our 6,000 staff who are somewhere on this planet. And it has been a, been a challenge because you would on the one hand assume that when staff members are excellent faculty, are used to teaching online they know how to work online right that's the assumption you might have but perhaps surprisingly to you many of our staff actually normally come to campus and work in teams on their teaching materials on their research so all of our members of staff also had to make a substantial transition if you like in terms of trying to to work at a distance so one of the big decisions we had to make, unfortunately, of course, all our teaching moved uh, completely online in March. And also we've provided a lot of clarity for our students by saying we will not go back to any face-to-face -face teaching until September 2021. So everyone knows we're in it for the long term. This gives us stability and also allows us to basically uh, plan ahead. What I think was in particularly very um, supportive by our uh, senior management was the recognition that everyone has to be able to cope with these difficult changes also in their family life. So I think the biggest plus thing that the university has done is we were given so-called contingency leave for up to 25 days to think about, okay, how can we make that transition effectively? And this was really supportive because it allowed faculty staff who had caring responsibilities or parental care to still teach online if you, if you take that metaphor, but also being mindful that things change very uh, rapidly. At the same time, uh, a kind of positive development linking back to what David was uh, saying is we were thinking, okay, how can we really help other institutions across the world and teachers in particular? How do we make sense of all this online learning? So what we developed in record number of time in even just a couple of weeks is a range of free online materials to how to teach effectively online and also develop small micro-credentials of um, 15 credits where teachers across the globe could say hey I suddenly have to teach online what could we actually um, do and it was really amazing to learn from all those different uh, perspectives and um, if you're interested um, I'm happy to share some of the links later on. Um, in respect to my own uh, line of work we, we train around a thousand members of staff every year about the latest um, practices of of online teaching and traditionally we did this perhaps surprisingly again we did this in a face-to-face -face manner so all our online teachers came to our lovely campus had a nice coffee some biscuits and we trained them face-to-face uh, -face. Um, and now suddenly of course it had to move 
online and I have some really nice positive data to report yeah, back to you. Um, so one thing we, we've noticed since COVID is that our uptake of professional development has increased by 43%. So we had a substantial increase in the number of teachers who wanted to participate and even came back for more training. So we must clearly do something wrong. Um, and the second thing we noticed was that um, even though all our trading moves online, also our satisfaction rates went up substantially. And I think this links very much to what the point which Dr. Barut mentioned before, is I think one of the, the joys of these kind of platforms is that it feels more democratic and participants and instructors have much more opportunities to interact, to learn from others. And um, I think that in part also explains how we were able to make that uh, provision over time. I think one of the things that um, we learned on a very practical level, if you think about um, online professional development training, not everyone is au fait with all the kind of technicality. So what we do with all our online training is that there's always one technical moderator that helps people to become familiar with the technology and with the processes so that the trainer can basically focus on on doing the amazing uh, pedagogy. So in a nutshell, although you would think this is a plain sailing, I think um, even at a distance learning university, we had to make a substantial transition. But I think for us as kind of experts and passionate advocates, I like the words activism for pedagogy. I think there's a great opportunity to, to show new and innovative ways of teaching. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, we have some time left for a discussion, and I would like to kick it off and then let all of the members decide where they want to go with this, but, and, or even change the topic if you wish. But I noticed a number of you talked about some pedagogical changes that you felt had happened, and some of them are very positive. Uh, I'd be curious about which one of those changes happened, what people's perception is about where this is going, about how to support the best pedagogy possible. After all, the goal of this whole system is to, in, is to enhance student learning and equity. So how do we do that with pedagogy and what's been happening there? Anybody have any comments about that? Dr. Weiner? Um, th thank you for the question. Um, I, I think from my perspective, the two aspects that of pedagogy that have received the most attention um, in our discussions with professors and with students are about assessment and engagement. Strategies for engagement are, are not unique to the remote environment, and I totally agree with the use of the term remote rather than online, um, but it's focused on Zoom and how do we use Zoom and how do we integrate. That's going to be different when we go back to campus. The conversations about assessment are equally applicable. So I, I think those are the ones that are likely to have the longest term impact. And the focus on how, what is the goal of assessment? Is the goal of assessment to actually um, assess students' learning and provide feedback to them on their learning? Or is the goal to come up with some kind of ranking of students? Is the goal to weed students out? Is the goal to be able to identify honors and, and who gets the awards? So there's a really deep conversation um, that's going on about that, which will absolutely be equally applicable to the campus-based world. So I think that's where we're going to see the long-term most substantive impacts of this on the university teaching and learning experience. Anyone else here on pedagogy? David? I, so, I mean, just building off of what Laurie was saying, I mean, you know, one of the things that we've been really struck by at Carleton has been the sort of wholesale belief and adoption of, of continuous assessment. Uh, by by almost everybody and you know in part you know, they've taken our advice right as the teaching learning center you know assess uh, often have lower stakes assessments in online spaces and that'll uh, that'll help with the engagement piece but it'll also help with student success but we're now entering into we've now reached another conundrum and that is actually the significant uh, workload that students are now facing 
by the fact that everybody is doing continuous assessment. So we're now sort of going, okay, well, what's the, what's the happy medium here and what's the balance? And, and, you know, so on, on one level, they've, they've adopted what we all hold up in, in teaching learning centers as good pedagogical practice, namely continuous assessment. But now we, we've got a, a bunch of students who are <laughs> really struggling under a significant load. And so what we're going to have to do going forward is find out again, that balance. We don't want to lose the principle, right? Namely about assessing for student success. Um, but we also don't want our students to be struggling under extraordinary, uh, under extraordinary assessment loads, which um, means that they, they have little time for anything else. And, and that's, that's a big conundrum that we have yet to figure out. You know, it's interesting that there's a considerable amount of evidence that, um, as you were putting it, long, uh, short-term low, lower stakes assessment, when it's used, can actually increase learning enormously. Uh, so it's not only an assessment tool, um, in the sense that Dr. Weiner was talking about it, of, that, that it tends to formatively, you know, formative support students, their learning, uh, but it, uh, it, it actually significantly increases learning. So maybe there's a positive there. Um, any other comments about pedagogy? We can go anywhere you like with this. Maybe if I, I start, I mean, I saw the question about problem-based learning, and this is one of my uh, hobby projects coming from Masters University many years ago, where problem-based learning was everything, and everyone had to follow problem-based learning. I think what we've noticed at the Open University was that, I mean, all these online tools are amazing, and the asynchronous and synchronous tools are very amazing for those who have good internet skill, internet access, good skills, but what is perhaps slightly different from all the other universities is that we have a substantial group of students from um, kind of uh, particular socioeconomic backgrounds but also students who have a declared disability around 10 percent of our students have a declared disability and um, doing an online session in a synchronous manner especially if you think about problem-based learning sessions like this where you re interact and engage can be particularly really demanding for our students. So what we have tried to do is to also provide services for uh, people with, for example, visual or hearing impairment issues so that we, for example, provide the recording or the automated text. So MS, MS Teams, for example, automatically automates whatever you're writing uh, or saying, sorry. And that is, has been seen as considerably uh, useful for the, those groups who have additional um, learning needs. So it's important to keep in mind that while problem-based learning is a very, very uh, positive uh, uh, development for a significant number of students, there are those that don't work well with it, that need other support. And maybe one of the benefits of remote learning is that it allows us to, I hope, to tailor to some extent, the types of pedagogy that we provide to students. Uh, at least that's certainly one of the hopes for the future. Um, any other comments about problem-based learning? Any place else that you, any other comments that you want to pick up on? Uh, Richard, if it's okay if I just jump in on the problem-based yeah. learning piece, just to have a quick reflection. A few years ago, when I was uh, based at Witts University in Johannesburg, I actually ran a an asynchronous problem-based course all online between students at Wits and students at University of Guelph. And um, it worked extraordinarily well uh, through the use of discussion boards and, and uh, through the, the learning management system we were using at the time. And so I think, you know, even in this uh, type of dynamic where problem-based learning, nat you know, where we, where we naturally sort of uh, focus on, on PBL as, as being a good, you know, good synchronous pedagogy, um, it does actually have benefits uh, asynchronously, and I'm now kicking myself that I didn't write that paper about that experience uh, with that with that course. We collected data and everything. I just never got to it. So um, I could see how it would have been helpful in this moment. But, you know, it's good to think about it in, in, as a sort of a flexible pedagogy as well, not just one that is solely suited to a synchronous type of dynamic. Well, it would have been welcome, that paper. I think there's a lot of discussion about problem-based learning. There's some extreme forms of it that people have claimed are not only not helpful, they're hurtful. Um, the difficulty with uh, most of these pedagogies is to have clear definitions, uh, operational definitions that help those of us that are trying to implement these from day to day. And I would say being clearer about that in the future is one way that we can be 
more helpful to both faculty and students that are struggling with uh, developing and continuing to develop remote learning. Um, uh, any other issues that came up during this conversation that anybody wants to pick up on? We have about 10 minutes left, so a good yeah. time for discussion. I'd, I'd like to address some of the questions that have been coming in in, in the chat about um, should faculty reduce the content covered in their courses? They're all about workload, either student workload, instructor workload, and then mental health and wellness, which are related quite tightly to workload. So I think there's a few different angles there. For all of these problems, we really need to take systemic approaches. But in terms of from the Teaching and Learning Center, what we're promoting is A, trying to encourage um, pro people who are teaching courses within the same program or to the same cohort of students to try and coordinate amongst themselves so that they have a sense of what the overall workload is for the students because that's also often very invisible. I'm teaching my course. I think my workload is totally reasonable. Times five, it's not. And we all know that in the online world, nobody would ever take five courses at the same time. So we're not quite online, but the workload issues are similar. So we're really trying to encourage people to coordinate. That will also probably have the impact of reducing the number of accommodation requests that the instructors get, as well as probably reducing the overall number of assessments from the extreme that it's at now. The other thing we've been looking for are tools that can help support um, distributed assessment. And what I mean by that is how can we um, have assessments that can easily be graded? Uh, we have a lot of large classes at McGill. So easily create, be shared amongst TAs that are assigned to a course or graders. How can all of the logistics of that be managed? And there are some tools that are really good at doing that. And we're trying to get those uh, those tools into the hands of the instructors that can benefit from them from them so that they're not you know computers are really good for a lot of grunt work and logistical grunt work and that's the work that we're trying to um, offload from the instructors and from the TAs because people aren't particularly good at it and it's exhausting and we all have better things to do with our time so I would say all of these things um, go towards supporting instructor wellness um, by uh, helping them manage their own workload better, which will, I think, have the very direct impact of managing the student's workload better. Any of the rest of you had workload issues come up that you wanted to comment on? That was a question from one of the participants. All right, any place else that you would like to go? Any other comments? I would uh, I just uh, want to mention uh, uh, something uh, very positive uh, with our experience is uh, the introduction of uh, open educational resources and the activities, you know, which were free and open for our faculty members. They really appreciated the, uh, those resources, especially, you know, like, uh, so they don't have to to waste their time, you know, designing activities, creating uh, material content, you know. And uh, we did a lot of work in uh, uh, putting them uh, as, uh, su in subject areas, you know, for example, uh, virtual labs, for example, the, our uh, professor, uh, you, uh, they were asking about labs, you know, chem chemistry lab, physics lab, what we do. So, you know, we created a lot of uh, uh, websites which were free and open for uh, virtual experiment and stuff like that and so on and so forth. So the open educational resources that, uh, you know, uh, were introduced and uh, the, uh, were very much appreciated by our faculty member. And I think this is very important. And this is something that it should be built on for the future too. Excellent. Anyone else? Uh, Richard, I'd be, I'd be happy to address um, Alex's question around the sort of future of the, of the residential uh, university and in particular about characteristics. I mean, perhaps allow me to be a bit provocative in this moment and to suggest that, um, you know, if universities don't change coming out of this moment, then we're entirely redundant and we are going to be redundant and it will, will go the way of the dodo very quickly. 
And I mean that in the sense that, um, you know, for many years, uh, we focused a lot on disciplinary content and the delivery of disciplinary content uh, as a distinguishing feature of our, of our institutions. I think what this moment has shown is that there are all sorts of ways to deliver disciplinary content that doesn't require us to sit in a lecture space and to be passive recipients of information coming from, from a, an, esteemed, uh, an esteemed colleague. And so we're gonna have to, I think, accept the fact that there are multiple di ways to communicate disciplinary information. We're gonna have to then reconsider what's the value proposition that getting people to come to a campus uh, offers. And I, and I think in many respects, we're gonna have to think about the whole individual a lot more clearly. I think we're gonna have to think about the types of skills that we foster and we inculcate and the types of experiences that we um, enable our students to have in that residential type of environment. And I'll, and I'll say it up front, I believe in the residential university. I believe in the idea of face-to-face. Of -face. Um, and, and that I think should continue, but we're gonna have to change that quite clearly and be really explicit about that move away from just providing disciplinary content uh, in our face-to-face -face or our residential experiences and be much more um, forthcoming about and explicit about the, the broader development of the whole individual. Well, that was eloquent. <laughs> that was terrific. Anybody else have a comment about uh... All right. Um, let's just step back for a second. Um, all of us have been involved in some way with attempting to do more online, to, to get everything moved online that has not been. Um, I, I'm, it's, it's even interesting to hear uh, Dr. Rientes talk about the challenges to an, on, an already online university with all of this. And I have a feeling that the silver lining in this crisis that we're in is going to be a whole lot more focus on doing a much better job of student learning. In other words, vast improvements in pedagogy, uh, not only how we teach, but what we teach, uh, much more conversation about how people learn, uh, and, and, and some very basic conversations. Uh, I, I, Dr. Weiner's point about the different functions of assessment in universities is a very critical point. We st I mean, it's for many people, it's a, it's a talent contest to do assessment and courses rather than try to find out who learned what. Uh, and that talent contest is, is often, it's conducted in a way that actually doesn't give us information about learning. So the bottom line is that we have a, a, a lot of opportunities to bring up conversations that are critical to have to bring them up in a context where we have to be able to make some very concrete decisions about what we do online uh, and to have a, a hopefully out of this, a much clearer idea about how to go about this in a way that we can replicate what works and avoid what hasn't. So I'd say that this, uh, many of the comments that were made here today, we ought to find a way to, to capture them and summarize them in a fashion, not only in the report that we did, but in ongoing work, where we, we try to make it clear to those of our colleagues who are doing this work, what has worked, what hasn't worked, what, we, what, would, what do we need to continue, how do we support it as we continue it, and how do we basically do a better job in universities in the future, whatever form they take. Uh, thanks very much to the panel, to everybody that signed in, um, I'm, unless anybody has any final words to say, I'm ready to sign off. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much.